Welcome to the Vision for Life podcast, an ongoing conversation between the pastors of Fellowship Denver and the church at large. Each week we talk about life, faith, the Bible, and how to follow Jesus as we go about our daily lives. I'm Autumn, host of the Vision for Life podcast, and everything we discuss here is about God's revelation of himself to us. His revelation of himself brings wisdom and clarity to those who lack the ability to see. It provides us with a unique spiritual light that allows us to see things that we couldn't previously, unaided by God's word and by God's spirit. And Hunter is joining me on the podcast today. Hunter, welcome. Thanks for having me back, Autumn. Today we are taking on a couple of questions from people in our church family. We periodically slate in these question and response episodes. And I was wondering if you would share a bit about what your hope is for this type of episode. When I have my my pastor pants on, one of the things that I often feel like is that I'm disconnected from the questions people are just wrestling with every day. So I really love this kind of episode because we get to hear from people and what's in their mind and we get to talk about it. And then we talk about it and, and we intentionally name these question and response, not question and answer, because one of the things I try to do as a pastor is is not just get people to relate to me as the guy who has all the answers. Mm-hmm. Now, on some things, I do have answers, especially if they are matters of what does the Bible teach about this or what does the historic Christian faith teach about this. I've got a lot of answers about that stuff, and I don't mind I don't mind sharing them or oversharing them. In fact, I have a dad who over explains everything. So if you ask my dad a question about something that he is well versed in, I mean just just buckle your seatbelt and and get a beverage because you're getting ready to get a long explanation. So being my father's son, I have the same <laughs> tendency. Uh, what's your what's your dad's name? Larry. Larry. So maybe we can invoke that as a as a verb here. You know, if if I find that you're having a tendency to do the same thing, to shift into over explaining. My dad's grandfather name is Elbow, as in Larry Beaumont Elbow, and so uh, my brothers and I will say, "I'm getting ready to elbow you," and, and that <laughs> means uh, not that I'm going to throw my elbow at you, but that I am going to explain something until you don't want it explained anymore. That's that's what it means to elbow something. But you learn a lot in that scenario. Great. Maybe maybe we'll include that into our lingo here. Well, already I've been way elbowing down a rabbit trail here because, because we're, what I was starting to say before I got diverted was I don't just want people to relate to me as the guy who has answers about everything, but rather uh, someone who enjoys conversation and likes to help other people think. For themselves. And that's really what the question and response, as opposed to the question and answer we're hoping to do, is to help everyone raise their thinking and raise their processing a little bit. So our hope for these episodes is that you submit something you'd like to hear talked about. Maybe it is a question. And then we talk about it in a way that invites you to to think some more about it and to clarify what your own thoughts and opinions are. Mm -hmm. And it likely, if you have this question, very likely someone else in our church family, some of our listeners probably have a similar question. That's exactly right. (laughs) Our first question today is in reference to our prior podcast episode in which we discussed an article called The Six-Way Fracturing of Evangelicalism. And so the, the listener sent in a question based on our conversation last week. Great. I love this, these kinds of questions. So we're going to pick up that conversation and respond to this question. If you have not listened to the prior episode, it might be helpful to listen to that one before listening to our response to this question. Or just to read the article, The Six-Way Fracturing of Evangelicalism. If you yes. Google it, you'll find it. Uh, But it's on the website, mereorthodoxy.com. Yes. It's a great tip. You could also read that article and then listen to our response to this question. So our listener asks, my nagging question at the end, so I'm going to fill in here, at the end of listening (laughs) to that prior episode. We did not answer all the listeners' (laughs) questions apparently and left them with a nagging question. Uh, which Which is great. This is the sort of continuing the conversation that we love. So my nagging question at the end 
of last week's conversation is how do we distinguish between cultural and gospel issues? Hunter exhorted us to recognize that cultural differences are okay and normal within the body of Christ. It seems to me, however, that a lot of the debate between categories one through four and maybe five is over whether people in a category different than our own are quote unquote true believers. How do we answer this question? So for context, this article is basically saying the evangelical stream of Christianity in America, and we talked last week about what that is and where it's come from, this evangelical stream, which has affected many of us, even if we wouldn't even call ourselves evangelicals, this evangelical stream is fracturing, and it's primarily fracturing over the question of how do we respond to different things that are going on in our culture. So often these people hold the same basic beliefs about God or about Jesus, but they uh, differ in how to respond to these cultural questions. And he, he, the author broke out six different categories. That's what the listener is referencing. And these categories were uh, kind of going from right to left, so to speak. Uh, on the right, ones he called neo-fundamentalist evangelicals, then mainstream evangelicals, then Toward category three, he called neo evangelicals. Category four, he called post evangelicals. And category five, he called de church, but with some Jesus. And then, kind of to continue the, the stream at the far end of the spectrum, he called de church and deconverted. Like these are people who have just left Christianity altogether. So the listener is just noting that the debates between people in these different categories can often feel so intense, and maybe even in our minds rise to the level of intensity we start to go. If we differ so much with someone on these issues, are they even a Christian? And often that's coming from the place of we feel like the the conviction we've landed on is really consistent with our Christian faith and really consistent with the gospel. And so we kind of go, how could you land in a different place if you are a Christian? If I summarize the tension well, yes, I think so. And you also referenced a particular, uh, a specific example in that you've experienced this sort of differing stream effect within some of your own relationships. And people who on the continuum that you described have maybe moved more into category four or five, and that some of the conversations then that you have with them really reflect a more liberal theology. And in those issues, you've come to think, well, that's not actually an orthodox historic Christian viewpoint on said issue. And so therefore, I wouldn't say that that perspective is a Christian perspective. Mm. And so you gave that as an example. And I think some of the listener's question is based on that. How do you make that judgment call? (laughs) So sort of what you were describing as your own process, your own thought process, and your own experience in some relationships, maybe is helping them call to mind some of their own questions about how do we, how can we make that determination? And I would also add, I have a lot of friends who have moved more toward number one, the neo-fundamentalist perspective, as things have gotten more tense. But how do I kind of make this determination? It is, first of all, an awareness of what the gospel is. And, and this would be just my exhortation to everyone. The clearer we are on what the gospel is and what is entailed in the gospel itself, like what is the kernel, the core of the Christian faith that, that we would call the gospel issue. The clearer we are on that, then the more clear we're going to be on what is not the gospel as well. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing, is be really clear on what the gospel is. Then there's a whole second category of issues and questions that I would call gospel-adjacent. And on these questions, there is usually a historic Christian consensus about what the Bible teaches on these things. Sometimes there's even a creed, not all the time, but sometimes there's even creeds or confessions that have summarized what the consensus is. But the point is, on these issues, there is widespread consensus across 2,000 years and across cultures Mm. about this is what the Bible teaches. So it would be hard to just go, well, that's just a cultural issue, because really many, 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 many different cultures have said, no, this is this is what the Bible teaches on these issues. Now, I probably bring a little bit of an advantage, so to speak, on this, in that 
I have a master's of theology in historical theology, so so I've devoted a good chunk of my life to studying historic Christianity for the last two thousand years and different streams of it. So so I'm I'm aware of this in a way that I probably wouldn't expect every Christian to be to be aware of, right? Uh, and that I wasn't aware of before I kept studying it. But some of these issues are things like uh, the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ. Like, is is he God and man? Well, there's nothing in the gospel about, well, Jesus is God and man in one person. That's, But it sits so closely to the gospel that if you believe that he was not God and man in one person, it, it's going to necessarily change how you would articulate and what you would think the gospel is. And you, you would also depart from historic transcultural Christian consensus mm-hmm. on that. Um, an issue in our day that we bring up a lot is sexuality. You're not going to find a creed summarizing sexuality. The reason you're not going to find a creed is that it's not until the last 200 years in our little corner of the world, Western culture, uh, which would be like America and Europe, in Western modern culture, which really began 200 years ago, that you really had a culture that had the historic had moved from the historic influence of Christianity into a post-Christian kind of culture and then rethought the Christian sex ethic as a result of that. So mm-hmm. so you won't this was not a debate in in the life of the early church. Now they differed in the early church. They differ from their culture, from Roman culture, for example, in sexuality, mm-hmm. but there was consensus among among Christians. And if you look across the last two thousand years and across many different cultures, you will see that there's a Christian consensus on what the Christian sex ethic is. And to depart from that consensus means that you start to rethink uh, what it means to repent. You start to rethink uh, what it means to be human. You start to rethink what the human identity is. You start to rethink how we read Scripture. You start to rethink all these things that will end up causing you to basically adjust the gospel to accommodate that. So one of the things that's been fascinating to watch as Western culture has moved into its modern kind of uh, self-identification, sex ethic, and what it would call sexual liberty, the people who have most clearly called Western culture to account are often Christians from other cultures. So like the Afri- African Christians have been calling European and American Christians to account on the sex ethic, and they've been saying, no, you actually cannot change that without departing from the faith. And and so that's been fascinating to watch. So that's another issue where I would go, hey, it's not just like, oh, di- people in different cultures have different sex, sex ethics. Mm-hmm. It's actually a departure from the historic Christian faith. So to, to summarize, I think my, my mind goes to, first, what is the gospel? Let's be really clear on what the gospel is. This is why we work really hard to define the gospel and different dimensions of the gospel and to articulate them. And then secondly, what are the issues that sit adjacent to the gospel where there is widespread Christian consensus? You might call it orthodoxy. There's widespread Christian consensus across history and across cultures where to depart from that consensus is going to then cause you to rethink other dimensions Mm -hmm. of the gospel. This also requires being wise to prevalent messages in our culture to a certain extent to be able to, it not only requires, as you were explaining, some understanding of the gospel itself, of matters of consensus throughout Christianity, throughout the historic Christian tradition and faith, but also an ability to assess culture to some degree I don't think that means we have to be intimately experientially acquainted with those aspects of culture. We may be, but for instance, within the matter that you just described, Hunter, a understanding of biblical sex ethic as it's become a matter of consensus throughout centuries now of Christian practice and faith, and then looking at our own culture's posture towards sexuality, which says freedom of sexual expression is one of the highest values that we can attain. And to be able to realize that that prevailing notion is simply indirect conflict with the Bible. With and not it's only biblical, fresh out of the box, brand new. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it is brand new. <laughs> Our culture is trying it on, as it were, right now. 
there are cultural differences. We can come to opinions on cultural matters that differ. And our listener who submitted the question recognizes that as well. They state, Hunter exhorted us to recognize that cultural differences are okay and normal within the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And once you're really clear on what the gospel is, and you also have some clarity on what these uh, transcultural gospel-adjacent consensus issues are, once you're clear on those two things, then you should probably default into other things are cultural preferences. That's one category we could say, cultural preferences. And others are what Paul in Romans 14 would call matters of conscience. And I like that term, matters of conscience, because it's acknowledging that I actually have worked out a conviction on this about what I think is best or what I think is right. So it's it's going to feel like a conviction to me. It's not just going to feel like, oh, who cares, you know? It's going to be something I am passionate about, and yet it's, it is, at the end of the day, a matter of my own conscience, and others might have a differing conscience. I also like the term cultural preference because that term acknowledges that where I sit culturally, which could include where I live. It could include my family and my upbringing. It could include uh, my socioeconomic status, where I sit culturally. It could include my work and what I do and what kind of company I work in. Where I sit culturally, we all sit in a place culturally, where I sit culturally is very likely to influence how I process these matters of conscience. It's going to affect what I see. And people who live in a different place or work in a different field or have a different family upbringing or maybe live a different place socioeconomically than I live, like they may see things differently than, than I do. And and when we can come to each other and know that, it actually helps us to experience more of the of the unity and the riches that we have in common in, in Christ. Any of those things that you just mentioned can be elevated to a place of priority and can become entrenched in our minds. So a conviction can become equivalent to, if we allow it to, or sometimes if we listen to certain influences, can become equivalent to one of the categories that you were just mentioning something that's inherent to the gospel itself or a matter of consensus, we sometimes erroneously elevate matters of conviction or conscience or cultural preference to a position of truth that is equal in weight to or even exceeds these other matters. And that is when those issues become extremely divisive. And I think we can watch it when we're saying things in our heart or in our mind, or maybe even out loud, like, I don't even know how someone could be a Christian and vote that way or think that way. And I actually see that a lot on social media. I see people saying, like, I don't even know how that person is a Christian, and they hold that position. And that's just a little warning sign to me that this thing has maybe become so important in my heart that I'm going to use it to kind of separate myself from other people. That, as a practice, tends to happen within this continuum, in these categories that the author of the article offered up. That sort of exclusivity or division around those sorts of matters you have noted tends to happen most towards the edges of this continuum. That's right. I I have seen that, and that's just kind of my own observation. It seems to me like the people that sit on the on the poles of this continuum tend to struggle the most with elevating secondary issues to primary issues. And so if I go to the far right, I I definitely see that in the fundamentalist stream, or what this author called the neo-fundamentalist stream. Well, you also see that historically. Again, I'm kind of a historian, so I've, I've studied the history of fundamentalism in America, and that really, I think, is what happened with fundamentalism in America, is they elevated a lot of secondary things, matters of conscience, to, to be primary things. And I also see it happening a lot today on what this author would call maybe the de-churched but with some Jesus end of the spectrum. And the author just calls these people who have left the church, but they still hold to at least some Orthodox Christian beliefs. So these are people who would still self-identify as Christian, but they are so fed up with evangelicals that they, they just don't belong to any church anymore, or, or maybe they just like, I'm, I'm Christian, but I, 
struggling with the church. What what often happens with those folks is they've so enmeshed Christianity with evangelicalism, like those things are so undifferentiated in their mind that it's hard for them to just even hold on to a Christian identity because they just it's like they hear an evangelical preacher who triggers them every time every time they think of anything and so for them it's really hard work to go these are actually core gospel issues not just things that evangelicals believe like let me let me introduce you to some christians in nigeria they they hold the same thing and and let me let me take you back into church history and and introduce you uh to some second and third century christians you know they they kind of believe the same things it's really hard for them uh to kind of go there and so I think on both ends of those these poles, it's it's pretty hard to to keep these things separated out. Which is one of the reasons last week I told our listeners I sit in the the third category, and it's not just because I want to be kind of a a mediator or or a split the difference. It's actually because, and again, I'm gonna kind of tip my cards of conviction. I think it's the rightest or, or the or the wisest. Uh, I, I'm there by conviction. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm neo-evangelical by conviction. I think it most closely aligns with how Jesus calls us to relate, be centered in the gospel, and relate to the world around us and relate to other Christians. What would be an example of a conscience issue that within one of these categories can sometimes rise to the level of belief or become a matter of separation? Well, let me give you quite a few examples. How do you educate your children? What's the best way to educate your children? That's a conscience question that every parent has to ultimately answer. Um, how, How do you relate to secular understandings of race and justice that aren't rooted in the Bible? Can you uh, find some common ground with them and then try to work with them? Should you wholesale adopt their viewpoint, which I would argue no, but but can you find some common ground? Or do you have to differentiate completely from them because it's not biblical? That would be a hot issue right now in our kind of cultural dialogue that's happening can a Christian drink alcohol, and what should a Christian do in relation to secular media or or popular culture? How should we relate to popular culture? Uh, can a can a Christian live in a million dollar home? Uh, what what should be our relationship with money and and stuff? Is it okay for a Christian to have a vacation home or not? You know these are these are matters of of conscience and. How, how should a Christian vote, <laughs> and on what mm-hmm. issues should we vote on? These are matters of conscience. What can happen with all of these is we're, we're pressed to kind of work out our own convictions on these, and we have to. We have to think it out. We're, we're accountable for our life before God. What can often happen, though, is a community, like a church or a group of churches, will kind of work out an answer, often under the leadership of someone like me who's who's well-spoken and thoughtful and likes to think about things like this, they'll work out the answers to these questions. And then those answers will start to become within that community. They'll start to function as, this is really the answer to the question. Mm -hmm. And what you will experience then, if you're in that community, what you'll experience is, I mean, on paper, we may say a Christian could have a different position, but really you can't, or you don't belong in this community. So I've heard stories of people who would say, man, I went to a church where it was just like, it was just not acceptable for a Christian to have a luxury car. Mm -hmm. If you had a Lexus or a BMW or a Mercedes and you pulled into the church parking lot, you you were going to kind of get the stink eye because you weren't, uh, you weren't living modestly enough. Now, they would never say that's essential to Christianity or to the gospel. You know, they would never say, well, someone who drives a BMW isn't really a Christian. But functionally, what started to happen in that community is this understanding of how we should relate to possessions started to function as a litmus test for true spirituality. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've heard talked to other folks who have said, you know, I was raised in a community where really the best way to educate your kids was to homeschool your kids. And if you don't homeschool them, then 
you're really just settling for second best. And then it can quickly swing the other way. No, the best way to educate your kids is to put them in the public schools because if you don't put them in the public schools, you're you're not serving the common good of the whole city. And so if you know if you choose to private school your kids or you choose to to homeschool your kids, you you've kind of settled for the less justice oriented approach, right? Mm-hmm. These things can quickly rise to the level of this is really the most mature Christian perspective. This is the right Christian perspective. And when any of those things start to function like that in a community, I think what happens is it's harder to experience grace and it's harder to extend grace. Mm -hmm. Your experience of your relationship with God becomes more shifted now towards there's really not room for me to be messy or in process, which is really what grace allows for. Grace allows for us to to have room to process and to grow and it acknowledges we're going to still struggle. It doesn't really allow for that. I've got to kind of get to the right place pretty fast. And then it, those communities often have trouble experiencing grace. They just to say another way, they're not usually very good evangelistically Mm -hmm. or with non-Christians or with people who aren't in the same cultural place or conviction that they are because the message that starts to get communicated unintentionally is, a gospel plus message. It mm-hmm. it is like here's the gospel, but you also need to agree with us on these other things. And what non Christians hear is like, I've got to check all these other boxes or I can't belong to this community. So experientially they have trouble even hearing the gospel in that environment. So this is why I think it's really important that we don't let our our community, our church, be marked by over identification with one matter with one matter of conscience or one particular cultural perspective, but rather we we try to accommodate a breadth of perspectives and then keep the focus on the gospel itself. Grace allows us to hold our convictions and to differ on matters of conscience. That's right. And when we do that, we're actually creating the kind of church community in which people can experience even more grace Mm -hmm. as well. Well, we've worked the fuzz off that tennis ball. (laughs) (laughs) Work the fuzz off the tennis ball is a idiom that our very first operations director, Randy McQueen, used to describe me and and my neurosis. He would say, Hunter, you are working the fuzz off that tennis ball. And this was Randy's way of saying that I'm I'm over chewing on an issue and and I just need to give it a rest. <laughs> <laughs> so us using this term is the legacy of Randy McQueen. Thanks, Randy. Here at Fellowship Denver. So we've worked the fuzz off that tennis ball. We sure have. And we have another question. This one is unrelated to last week's episode and is different in its topic and content. The question reads, I think we as Western Christians can both romanticize and underappreciate violent persecution, especially instances from church history and what happens beyond our borders. Can you talk about what kind of encouragement the persecuted church can expect in the face of a lonely, agonizing death at the hands of wicked people? How can a citizenry such as ours, whose persecution is relatively subdued, meaningfully appreciate and respond to this peril our spiritual brothers and sisters experience? And I'm guessing this is on a lot of people's minds right now because of what we were, we're seeing in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. and. We're hearing stories, sometimes just through social media, but we're hearing stories of Christians in Afghanistan who are fleeing from the Taliban, who are in hiding, and who are very, very nervous about their future, and even if they're going to live or die. So I think this is kind of a question that recent events have brought to our mind. And I think one of the fascinating things about the Afghanistan situation for us culturally is this is a question that has kind of tended to transcend our left-right political divide. Mm -hmm. So there's people on the left and the right who are concerned about our response to what's happening in Afghanistan. Have we handled the situation right? It hasn't tended to break down along partisan lines. And so I think a lot of people are talking about and thinking about this right now. So what can Christians 
expect who are being persecuted. I, I want to take us back to the words of Jesus, and I don't want to do this glibly, and I, I recognize that like sitting here in a climate-controlled room in America, it's so easy to be glib about this, but, but this has been on my mind as I've been thinking about what's going on there. Jesus said when he opened his Sermon on the Mount, he said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So the first thing we can know is Jesus actually calls these brothers and sisters blessed by him, and theirs, to them, belongs the kingdom of heaven. And and I don't think he means you have to be killed for me in order to get into the kingdom of heaven. I don't think that's what he means. But rather, they their experience helps them to lean into and to long for the kingdom in a way that if we're not suffering that, we, we don't hardly even understand. Mm-hmm. So I want to lean into that as their as their hope. And and as things have been happening in Afghanistan, I've just been praying for the church there, just based on whatever information I can glean. I've just been praying for the church there. And as I enter into prayer, and often when I'm praying, I don't just start talking. I, I will come before the Lord and just go, Lord, what do I even need to be praying about? Mm-hmm. What do I even need to be asking for them? And what are, what are they experiencing? Help me know what they're experiencing, and then to put myself in their shoes and go, they're afraid. Um, They're they're afraid if they're going to die, so I'm I'm praying for courage for them. I'm praying that Jesus would be near to them. They uh, don't know if everything they've spent their life working for is going to last any longer, so I'm praying that they would have treasure in the kingdom of heaven and they would lean into that. Um, I also... And praying that the Lord will preserve a remnant church in Afghanistan, that he will not completely remove the light of the gospel from that country. So I'm, I'm praying, Lord, let some of these followers of Jesus live, preserve their life, so they can carry on the legacy of the gospel and the message of the gospel in their country. So these are the kinds of things I'm praying about. But my, I guess my answer, my response to the listener's question in terms of what we can do is let's enter thoughtfully and meditatively into prayer for them, putting ourselves in their shoes, asking God to show us what to pray for, and let's pray for them. I'm, I'm praying every night when I pray, I'm, I'm praying for uh, our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan right now. Mm-hmm. Scripture provides us a really unique way to think about oppressed people, persecuted Christians around the world, because much of the Bible was written from the locus of a persecuted people. Mm. So in the Old Testament, much of the prophets, the minor prophets, are written when Israel was experiencing extreme persecution, and you hear their lament and read the images of destruction that the prophets were relaying and that they're crying out to God about. That gives us a sense of, I think, a way to sit with the weight of it, and Scripture also gives us a very real, tangible hope, as you just described, for believers around the world in Afghanistan, in other places who are experiencing persecution. The New Testament writers, some of those books were written distinctly to, some of the epistles were written directly to churches experiencing physical persecution and direct oppression from the governmental systems in the places in which they existed. And the epistles don't ignore that, and they still hold out hope. As you mentioned in Jesus' words in Matthew, he says that the persecuted are blessed and that they have this certain inheritance. And we see that recognition again in places like 1 Peter 1, where Peter writes to the persecuted church and says they have a living hope because of Jesus' resurrection and because of their promised inheritance in him. So we can enter into both the weight and the reality and the need that is real being experienced and acknowledge that it is 
hard and mm. terrible and that we don't always know what to do. Mm. And we can acknowledge that believers in those places have a living hope, not in a glib way, but in a way that perhaps acknowledges that that is their best hope and what will sustain them. And that's our best hope too. And one of the things that entering into prayer for those who are persecuted will do for us is it will also cause us to reflect, have we framed our own faith up in eternal terms or not? Like, my best hope is the kingdom of heaven as well. And my, it's so easy in a more prosperous, comfortable culture where your rights are protected by the government, it is it is easy to then frame up the whole purpose of following Jesus as helping me live a better life now and have a more comfortable life now. You could even read the title of this podcast, Vision for Life. You could reduce it to that if, the, if that's what you mean. Like, like it's just going to help us live a good life now and have a more enjoyable life now. And our ultimate hope is, is in the kingdom of heaven. So your life now matters, and it matters because it's framed within this bigger story of the kingdom of heaven. And so I feel really challenged when I'm praying for my brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. I feel really challenged. Like, am I leaning into the kingdom? Like, what what risk am I taking for the kingdom of, of God? Where am I living by faith in the kingdom that is to come? Where am I letting the hope of resurrection in the kingdom shape how I relate to my own disappointments with my life right right now and, and my own struggles. So it's a it's challenging to us as well when we enter into that kind of prayer. Hmm. Hearing about and seeing images in media, reading about stories in various media outlets may create in us, I say this just from my own experience, a propensity to either feel guilty hmm. or want to hide away from the reality of the situation or to ask what we can do in terms of offering some sort of physical solution. And that often leaves us feeling helpless. And there are organizations both on the ground in places like Afghanistan and Syria, places experiencing extreme upheaval or civil war that are doing good work and so the desire to seek those out, to offer what you do have as resources, whether it's giving money or finding local organizations who are helping refugees from Afghanistan or other places as an ongoing part of their work here in our own city, giving of your time or your money to them, those are good inclinations and a way to ask, what can I do? However, I think, Hunter, your greater challenge is to actually wrestle with this and to sit in prayer with it repeatedly with God. Well, that's a good summary and a good challenge to us. And I do think we often as Americans default to where can I send some money? And the work of prayer and entering emotionally and intellectually into the work of prayer is actually harder than writing a check. And so uh, I want to call us into that. Thanks for joining me today, Hunter. If you have a question, whether something you heard today spurred a question in your own mind or you just are wondering about something and would like to send it in so that we could discuss it on the podcast, we'd love to hear from you. You can send your questions in at any time to podcast at fellowshipdenver.org. Thanks for joining us on the Vision for Life podcast. Thanks to Adam Englund for our theme music and to our producer, Jesse Cowan. 